Welcome. I am Daniel G. Garza, and this is another episode of Put It Together Conversations Podcast, five o'clock show. How's everybody doing? Thank you for joining us. Uh, remember, if you want to be part of the conversations, please send in your questions or your comments. All you can do is go specifically into the conversation part. Uh, remember, there's a black background in the thread. That way, you know you're part of the conversation. Uh, today's let me bring up my video so that I can see what we're doing here. Today's guest is oh there we go uh, that's how you know you're really on when you when you make mistakes on live television uh my guest today is sari rick karatash and let me give you a little bit of information on him he grew up in Syosset, new york and now resides in van Nuys, california as a gemini he goes by two names he's the author of rainbow relatives real world stories and advice on how to talk to kids about LGBTQ families and friends. And the writer and producer of the film, Welcome All in My Pradas. <laughs> there we go. I don't have my glasses and always uh -huh. folks when you do live, make sure you bring your glasses to the table. Uh, he's written many screenplays and songs and a letter to Dear RV once. And for more information, you can visit him at SaudiRick.com. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, I, I, as I'm reading this, uh, Rick, there is, uh, Saudi, there's a, uh, the book that I read is missing on here, right? It's why the book that I was reading is missing on here. The the catering book. The catering book is how catering sucked the life right out of me. But what are you asking? Is it? Uh... It's, it's, I, I didn't read it on here, right? I, I missed that on here. Oh no, you didn't. Um, I don't think I don't think you did. You said you talked about rainbow relatives and welcome on my products. Oh, yes. because that's probably taken from. The book, which the book, that's, that's where I got yeah. it from. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so we'll talk about more about that book in a minute because that's the book that I read. I feel like I'm taking a quiz, but teacher, that's the book that I read. Don't quiz me on something yeah. else. Um, and I know, I know, I'm confusing you with my name because I legal name is Sudi, and then I go by Rick. But either one is fine, like I said. So, so I, I like the name Sudi. So we're gonna go with Sudi for the show. Okay. Uh, Sudi, welcome to the show. And uh, as usual, I like to tell my get my uh, listeners and watchers. How I know my guest, I kidnapped him. I really took him from somebody else. Um, I, for many of you, some of you watched and, and listened, I was a guest at um, the radio station here in Laguna Beach uh, with uh, Craig. And uh, we talked about people in Laguna and um, Saudi's name came up. And so I immediately looked him up and to see who he was. And um, it was the song, it was, the, We'll talk about that in a minute, but was, there's one particular song that got to me, and, and we'll get more into that. Just saying, but um, so I contacted him, uh, and we're both here in, in Orange County, so he was very gracious to come on the show without knowing me, without knowing anything about me. He was kind enough to jump on the show. Thank you so much for being here. You, I actually had you mm -hmm. investigated and everything, and then I just did you. Yeah, and you <laughs> and you still came on. <laughs> that that says a lot about you. You're, yeah. You're, you're, yeah, you seek trouble, I can see. <laughs> How's it going? How are you doing? I'm doing okay, yeah. It's, um, you know, just stuck inside. I mean, I went for my daily walk today, but, you know, there's not too many places we can go with all, you know, the things closed down, the gyms closed, the, you know, restaurants, everything. So, um, but I do most of my work and stuff here anyway, so it's not like I'm, you know, going too crazy, but. Um. Yeah, and especially here in Orange County, things get all mixed messages from different, like what we can do, what we can't do. So, but I, I'm like you, I get to do a lot of my work from home. So it's 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 easy to not go completely crazy um, during all this lockdown. So how was your uh, Thanksgiving? How was your holiday weekends? It was all right. Like, yeah, I was pretty much here. And I oh, well, Thanksgiving Day was kind of exciting because the song that I wrote the Christmas song that I think you were just talking about was released on Thanksgiving Day. It's sung by Adrian Christian and it's called Midnight Will Be Clear, but he released it that day at like midnight, uh, it came out. So I was really doing a lot of stuff that day, kind of just letting people know about the song and stuff. 
Um, and other than that, I don't know, I guess I went for a long walk to work off the food I ate. And, um, but nothing too exciting. Um, cool. Yeah. So can we, can we talk about that, uh, that song for just minutes? Cause there's, the, you did a, the, the video that, okay. Not because you're here, but I watched your video first and I really like, I'm a fan. I, I like, I like your singing and, um, I like the song. Um, I, I've been clean and sober 13 years. So okay. it, it when as soon as I heard it, I was like, Oh, like, like I remember my first Christmas and New Year's clean and sober, and uh, how I, I I always say jokingly like I I realized how boring I really was at parties at, the, at the, my first sober Christmas, which I'm not. I'm pretty comfortable, but it, it really um, it 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 hit me like I was like oh wow like it reminded me because I got sober in June. Uh, June 21st, 2007. So that year, um, I was turning 37 and it was my first sober birthday. I'm, I'm, my birthday is December 26th. So it, it oh, was, God. yeah. So um, I, I'm sure you hear this, but thank you for that song. It is such a good well, song. No, can, you, can you talk more about it? Yeah, and I'm glad that touched you or moved you or maybe helps people. Um, I, I didn't write it like autobiographical or anything. It, it was just the, it was inspired to write it. Um, I was literally in bed in November and I don't know, thinking about Christmas and somehow I was thinking about the song. Uh, it came upon a midnight clear for some reason. And then I kind of just thought of a little twist on that song, like about a guy who, this is the first midnight in a long time that will be clear on Christmas because he quit drinking. And I just went with that idea and um, so that's what the song is about. It's about his New Year's resolution was to stop drinking. And so Christmas, he used to be, you know, drink at midnight mass, you know, before midnight mass and stuff. And so it just came to me and I wrote it um, and I recorded it myself. And I did the video you were talking about. We did a video and it was in, it went to a few film festivals this past year, which were all virtual instead of live, which wasn't as exciting, but, um, and we had fun doing the video. So I did the video, Mabul Marolanda, uh, directed it and I had Adrian Christian was in the video uh, Chris Allen was in it Tina Lynch um, Lupe Carranza we had a nice cast Larry Weissman and so they were in the, it's a really nice video about the story of this guy and um, Adrian who was in the video liked it so much he says you know I want to record it for my Christmas album that I'm going to be doing in Nashville so that's what he did he he recorded it I think in January February and, um, and it's the first single to be released from, the album is actually gonna come out next year, I guess, but he wanted to release the single. So it, it's, on, you know, now it's on iTunes and um, Amazon and Spotify and stuff. And there's a radio station in Tennessee it's, that's playing it um, and they're gonna play it again tomorrow. So that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's getting a lot of good feedback and I think it is because of the story and, and a lot of people can relate to it um, of, either struggling and staying sober through the holidays. Um, yeah, so I, I, this song just kind of just came to me yeah. and I just went with it. And then I, I love what Adrian did with the song. He oh. did really, I mean, I joke, I, well, I don't joke. I think he's a better singer in a lot of ways than I am. Um, and auto-tune can do a lot of things for me in this. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> I sound okay. No, but um, yeah, I, I joke, I can carry a tune if it's not too heavy, but. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I'm glad um, you liked. Yeah. yeah, I liked your version. Well, not I think it gets the gentleman, but I, I because I, I always think when the authors of a song recorded, it's like you have, you know where it comes from. Like I always get the feeling like like the author knows where it comes from. So there's a different feeling in the song. But anyway, I've shared your song in several of my sober pages, and it's gotten oh. some really good feedback. People really like it. So just so you know, I'm sharing it. And for those of you watching, we will share it here right after the show. So if you're curious about it, we're gonna post, I'll post both, both versions so you guys can check them out. Uh, but but yes, uh, so far the pages that I, the sober pages that I've posted it on, people are really enjoying it. So just so you know that. Well, I'm glad. It, I kind of say that my version is like, you know, when Dolly Parton, I will always love you, really <laughs> nice version. And then Whitney Houston came along and, and just made it a different song or whatever, and it, and it was nice too. So that's kind of how, and I don't know if we'll make, we won't quite make as much money as they did, but you know. <laughs> hey, 
You never know. It, it's it's a weird year, so you never know. Yeah. Uh, for those of you, yes, I, I, I'll, I'll stop here because I can gush about it all day long. But there's a there's a part of the video where it talks about going uh, going up the twelve steps or doing the twelve steps, and oh, that's my favorite was, part. Yeah, the bridge. Yeah, there were twelve was, steps. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, yeah, there are twelve steps he follows. There are twelve days of Christmas. But there's only one thing that saved him, the love of Jesus. But I, yeah, I thought that was pretty clever myself. <laughs> I was, uh, after the noon show, I, I had to run a couple of errands and went and got some lunch. So I was sitting at my table uh, eating lunch and reading over your book and, and listening to the video. And um, so I'm reading and listening because I multitask people. because I And um, I had to stop and, and go to the video and rewatch that part. And okay, so I cried a little. I cried just a oh, little. Nice. It was it was it was just again. I it it, it, remi it reminded me of like coming out of rehab and like yeah. having having to do the work to get to where I am. And um, so I'm thinking of writing a whole script, like a, a a movie around the song. Actually, at some point, maybe a Christmas movie. But we'll see if that happens. Yeah. Let me know where to send my resume and my headshot. <laughs> I, I'm in there. You're going to need a little Mexican in there somewhere. So, yes. yes. Uh, for those of you watching, you, this is Put Together Conversations podcast, 5 p.m. edition. And we have Sari Karatash with us today, uh, author, songwriter, multi talented artist. Um, and let's start talking about you. So, uh, Sari, tell us how you put it together. Um, Sudi, Sudi, actually, but Sudi, sorry. Um, I put, how I put, so how I put my, I think you were saying kind of how I put my life together, which I don't know if it's together yet, but, um, I've been out here in California, I think 18 years, but I'm from New York originally, Long Island, Syacet, which, um, Judd Apatow is from there, but he's, he, he kind of put it together a lot faster than, <laughs> um, but, um, and I was, you know, I, I've always liked to write. Like I, I've, I've been writing songs since I was like 14 and I never thought I would write full scripts or full whatever, but anyway, um, in fact, I went to school for business and marketing in upstate New York um, where it was freezing. I don't know why I get cold in California. because It was like 20 below where I went to college. I really shouldn't be complaining at 50 degree, degree weather. But um, yeah, so I lived in, uh, grew up in Long Island, lived in New York City for few years, went to HP Studios, took some acting classes because I wanted to get kind of go into acting. That's kind of what I always wanted to do. But then later realized I like writing even more than that. So I, yeah, it went from writing songs to writing sketches to, um, and then I wrote them just before I moved to LA. I thought of a, a movie idea, which became Welcome on My Pradas, which is kind of like Freaky Friday with a gay straight twist. Um, and we shot that out here and it was on Netflix. Had Tom Arnold, Dee Wallace, Mike Starr, Bruce Valanche, a lot of fun cast. Tom Archdeacon wrote it, co-wrote it with me and co-produced it. And um, it's on Amazon Prime now. And um, so that was the first, I never thought I'd write a full feature script, but um, I just, yeah, I just fell more in love with writing. And I, I, I mean, I don't feel like it's work. Like, I, like if people ask me what I enjoy doing, I find I'm always talking about writing and even though that's work, it's that's my kind of my fun also. Like, and I wish I had more time for that. But um, and then I wrote, uh, I had the idea for the book, Rainbow Relatives, which came out I think two years ago. Um, and that kind of, my sister, I was asking her if her her kids, my nieces and nephews, they were kind of little at that time. This is a while back, and if they knew about my. Uh, orientation and my sister's like I think so I'm not sure I'm not ha not sure how to approach that um, I wish there was like a book on that and uh, so I'm like oh that's a good idea so, <laughs> and I started interviewing people and and the, and that book came out I, I released that and I got, actually that one I got published which was cool um, but yeah I just keep writing whatever comes into my head like you know if it's a song or a book or a, um, you know and I've been catering for many years in, in New York and California because that's what a lot of actors and musicians and artists do. And so of course, there's so many stories in there and so many wacky things that happen. And then at certain times I would get so annoyed that I say, I gotta write a book and I gotta, you know, expose some of these people that are treating people badly. <laughs> I don't use real names in the book, but I mean, of the bad people. And there's good people in it too that I do yeah. use. 
really. But this, Wes, I was reading, as I was telling everybody, uh, mentioning when, when I was reading, there's a chapter in there where he, where you interview some folks about some uh, artists about their days in catering. There's a couple of names there that I'm like, oh, I know some of them. Uh, in fact, um, Mel has been on my show. So I oh. interviewed him. Yeah, yeah, I interviewed him uh, last year for the show. So he's been on here. Yeah, Mel England, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. it's funny. Yeah. I've never, I never catered with Mel, but the reason he's in my book is, oh, he did Electricity with Kevin Scott Allen. Who yeah. I did carry with years ago. He's a very talented actor, and so um, and now yeah, Mel is in it with Terry Ray. Terry, Terry Ray, Ray. Is his electricity, and um, so that's why they get a mention, you know, in the book. Actually, yeah. they slipped me a few bucks. No, I'm kidding. That didn't. <laughs> Good. They they need to now. Uh, a big hello to all of them. But yeah, Mel is a uh, alumni of the Put It Together podcast family. Um, but uh, so you, you you were mentioning about writing when you were young. Um, what were your early writings about? You know, it's funny, because I, I remember writing songs at 14, and I think I was thinking as a much older person or more mature. I mean, because I remember I wrote a song called I Wish I Could See, which was about how we take for granted our eyesight even. Like, it was about a guy who meets a, a little boy who's blind and realizes, the, the adult realizes how lucky he is just to have that, have the ability to see things, and we take that for granted. So at 14, you know, and I think I wrote something at 18, like, is it just a dream, which about, you know, we're always at war and this and that. And like, so I was writing kind of these country story songs because I listened to a lot of that. And I mean, I didn't know a lot about writing back then. So if I look at them, they're not great songs, but the ideas were good. And some of the stuff was okay. Um, oh, my, when I was four, I think the, do you remember the shampoo? Oh, no more, no. Johnson's baby shampoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnson, Johnson, yeah. That was in the house. So I was fourteen or fifteen, and so it's a, it said no more tears on the on the bottle. So I wrote oh, yeah. a song called No More Tears. I mean, this is you know I just yeah. But um, and then one of the first songs I wrote and made a demo of, and I was in my mid to late twenties by that point, uh, was a song called Somewhere Between a Buzz and a Coma. So it was a drinking song that Jimmy Buffett probably would have done if anyone could have got it, gotten it to him, but um. And that idea I came up with, we were going to a New Year's Eve party, driving somewhere and the window was fogged up because um, it was cold outside. And I just, I had that title and I just wrote it on there. I remember writing it on the window, somewhere between yeah. a buzz and a coma because it was New Year's Eve, Eve and a lot of people were going to be. <laughs> so that's anyways, pretty that's insightful for a 14 year old. I mean, Lord knows that I was not that in tune with stuff at 14, but um was there an inspiration for all that? Where do you, know, you, I, I don't know, you do I don't know. Well, I love Dolly Parton and I love her songwriting even as a kid. And so I think a lot of my ideas were kind of thinking along with the, with the way she would or story songs or, or songs that had meaning. So I think I just gravitated towards that. Um, and you do, I just thought of something, another, oh, it went right out of my head. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I just I always felt a very I'm very I think a sensitive person, so I would gravitate towards those kind of songs, and I like the songs that move people. And oh, that was the other one. When I was 14. A song called I remember it was something like I don't think that I don't think that the world turned out the way that God had planned. Oh, and wow. so I wrote a song, and I give that applies today. You know the stuff going on, but um, yeah, no, I wrote all kinds of like I don't know. They just uh, and I. You know, I had a few songs published way back, but nothing happened with them. Um, yeah, one was called Can You Spare a Lifetime? That was a nice wedding song. And uh, yeah, I have a, a wow. lot of good ideas. But... Have, you, have you thought about bringing those songs back or have you brought them back? Some of them have and revised them because some of them sound outdated or um, they don't fit the style or I know more about writing now, so I would change quite a bit of them. But yeah, I'm, a couple of my, what do you call that, revive or... Yeah. bring out of the like songs in the attic by billy joel i don't know if you remember that album but yeah. he, he he took a lot of his old songs and uh but um yeah but you know because i think some of the ideas are good and they're still original like i've there's certain songs i've written that I'm, i still have not heard a song like that with that title or that theme which is hard to do there's hard it's hard to find songs that no one's written that theme or that song that it's really hard but uh which i which I'm, that's why i'm kind of proud of the christmas song because it is kind of original it's not the all i want for christmas is you to me that's the most not original <laughs> you know it's been yeah. done a million times but uh you know that's interesting um so 
Talking about your move from New York to California, what prompted the move? Um, I was thinking about it for a long time. Um, the main thing was I was in New York, I was doing some acting, but there was very few, you know, I wasn't looking to do theater and that's New York is really more theater. Right. Um, and at the time, like the only four shows that were filming or TV shows were filming were Law and Order, Law and Order Special Victims Unit, Law and Order Criminal Tent, <laughs> and I still know what you did on Law and Order. Um, you know, and but, I mean, it was a few others, but, uh, and I'd worked a little bit on the soaps, a couple lines here and there and that, but yeah, mainly to pursue acting out here, film and TV, that's, that's what, and I, but I put it off for a few years. Um, and I can't believe it's been 18, yeah, 2002 I came out here, after 9-11, so that, actually, that was a little bit of a push too, like, you know, things were a little bit, after 9-11 in New York were kind of, you know, um, I mean, it bounced back, obviously, but that was a little bit of a push too, like. That was a push to go out here? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, because I, I, I hear from friends in New York who are actors, and they're like, yeah, I was, you know, bum number five, or something like that, I was like, yay, like, you made it, you're on TV, and yeah. The good thing, folks, is that if you make it on any of the SPUs or Law and Orders or stuff, those go on forever. So you, yeah. at some point, you're going to watch yourself. So that's a good thing. Yeah. So you get to California, and were you prepared for California? Yeah, you know, it's funny. A lot of people, when they move from New York to California, they don't. I, they, I hear them say they didn't like it, or they don't like it for many years, or they never learned to like it. Or, um, I, well, I didn't feel like I moved out here totally by myself. I mean, I came by myself, but a few of my friends had moved a little bit before I did. Uh, some friends moved around the same time I did from there and or shortly after. So I had like a group of people from New York that I kind of knew out here and that was good, that helped. Um, and then I met some cool people out here right away that uh, became friends with. And it takes, it took a while though to get, you know, in New York I was catering all the time and doing background work and stuff. And so I was getting a lot of work. But then when you go to a new place, you know, you don't have all the contacts you had and it's, you know, starting over. So, but yeah, so it was a short period of time where it was a little bit, okay, I have my money that I brought with me and it's before it dwindles all down and I finally started getting a little more work. And again, the catering, because I knew how to do that and <clears throat> I did a lot of that. And uh, yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, that, that helps because when I moved here from Texas, when I lived in, I started acting in Houston and in Houston, I knew, like you said, you know, the people. So I'd show up to an audition and it was me and like four of my other friends that looked alike. And then we would look at the size. I'm like, oh, you're, you're going to get this. This is for you. And surely enough, they get, and then we all go to lunch afterwards. And then I moved to California and one of my very first auditions uh, that I thought was a big, was a, big, a Bud Light commercial. And me and I was like, oh, me, yeah, you didn't want a little Mexican guy. I show up and there's a hundred guys that look just right. like me. And I'm like, so this is where all my family is. <laughs> and yeah, that was a big shocker and surprise. But um, I did, when, I think one of the reasons that I, I kind of connected with your story is I was in the promotion and brand ambassador field in, um, in Houston. So when I moved to California, I just moved all my contacts here and kept working. Um, was it... Was it easy? Because in your book, you talk about it eating you up. Like you start doing these flexible oh, cool. jobs and, and all of a sudden you get cut up. Because I know I did. Uh, there was promotions all the time. So it was easy to book yourself seven days a week and just work. And then you forget you, you can audition. Or I was, I was wanting to launch my own productions. And um, once you got here, did you get sucked up into that catering world right away? Uh, uh, well, a little bit because you, you, know, you need the money and if you can get five days of, of work and it's, it's not bad, some of it's not bad money. There are certain gigs you work that's it's pretty good. So you do get kind of sucked in and you feel like, okay, I gotta pay my bills, I have to, but you, there's a balance I think you have to, I, I talk about a little bit in the book of a balance of, you know, what do you really wanna do and what do you have to do to survive and kind of balance it out or just make that jump and go for it. I mean, which I think a lot, I think the people that really do that are more apt, you know, they're just focused and, and I think there's something to that. Um, but so, yeah. And then I, but what I did was I would, yeah, make time for both. So I would take time off to go shoot my movie and then go back. That's what's good about catering, the flexibility. And you can go back to whoever, um, yeah. you know, is, uh, 
so that was good. But um, it took a while to, um, I think too many people do get sucked in and they only do that and they call themselves actors, but they're not going in auditions. They don't even have updated headshots. They don't go to classes. They don't, and they, they're like catering 20, you know, six days a week. And you, then you're exhausted. And that's part of the book too. I was like, I would work a 12 hour day catering and the next day be exhausted and too tired to do my own stuff. And I'm like, I just worked for someone else for 12 hours. If I spend all that time working on my projects and my writing and my auditioning and this and that, you know, imagine what I could do, but. Uh, yeah. So for those of you watching and going, well, what? Yeah, well, uh, the catering business or the and or the brand ambassador promotion jobs, uh, well, we're kind of shut down right now, but uh, prior to February, prior to March, uh, even, uh, not even, here in California, especially Southern California, catering for events, especially with Hollywood and everything going on, there's always an event, because I did some catering and some some waitering and, and serving tables and stuff. So the, the, it, it, it was everywhere. And surely, you, I mean, I, I'm sure it happened to you too. Like you show up to cater an event or work an event and you turn around, it's like somebody you were on set with. Like, hey, we were on a, oh. Oh, we were on the set together. You remember, does that, did that happen to you? Well, I, there's a story in the book, my book, um, well, how catering sucked the life right out of me. This was when we, I had a couple months after we shot my movie, Welcome on My Pradas, we had Tom Arnold in, in my in the movie. And I was serving hors d'oeuvres in an event and there's Tom Arnold and I woke up to him, you know, like I've, with the hors d'oeuvres and I'm like, and so I kind of made a joke, you know, like, um, hey, until the movie starts making money, I, here I am. And he was really cool. He's like, yeah, no, I know, I, I get it, I, I understand. And there was nothing to be ashamed of or anything, but you kind of yeah. feel like I just had him on my movie set and now I'm working a catered event, but, and another time I was a guest at a Emmy part, a pre Emmy party on a Friday night. And then I had to work, work an Emmy party on the sun the couple days later. So that was kind of, you know, uh, not too my, much uh, my, my closest story to that is I did a, it was a pilot uh, for a show for, with Rain Wilson. And, um, Anyway, I, I played a, a day laborer. We were looking for work, and my um, my my they never aired. It never went anywhere. Like a lot of things do out here. But my uh, my big moment was that Rain Wilson was in this big yellow Hummer, and he pulls up to buy to to um, hire some day laborers, and I jump up on the window, and he looks over at me, and he was improving a lot of stuff, and he's like. Well, how much for how much to just take him or something like that? And and I was like, ooh, like he pointed at me, like, ooh. Anyway, but and then like a year later, a friend of mine who former friend of mine who had a uh, kids party event hired me to be a uh, it was a, a cops and robbers kind of party, and I was the the thief, and I show up and Brain Wilson looks at me and goes which is kind of cool because we're not friends anymore. The guy that I worked, uh, we show up and he's like, don't talk to the to the owners and don't talk to the guy, the host. Blah, blah, blah. Like, you need to be respectful. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, I'm just here for the, I'm just here for the job and the money, like whatever. And we walk up and Ray Wilson looks at me and goes, hey, don't I know you? And I'm like, yeah. So he goes, when's that, what was it? I was going to pay for you to go home with me, wasn't I? I'm like, yeah, that was me. And my friend's like, well, how do you know him? I'm like, we work together, dude. Like, calm down. So that was my big story. That is my big Rain Wilson story, folks. There you go. Um, well, but, it's funny uh, when you do catering, you know, they yeah, tell you not to talk to the um, the guests and if, especially if the celebrities, you, you know, you're friendly, but not too friendly. And, you know, they're not, you're not there to tell, they're not there to hear your life story or how you're an actor and all that kind of stuff. But I worked at one event where it was an Emmy, pre-Emmy thing or something. And uh, Ron Raines, uh, who was used to be on Guiding Light and he was up for uh, Tony's in on Broadway and stuff. And I had done The King and I with him years and years ago. And he was at this event and we hadn't seen each other in years. And I, he was up for an Emmy that year for The Guiding Light or something. And so I'm talking to him and we're catching up. It's been like 10, I don't know, eight, nine years. And all I could think in the back of my head was the caterer's gonna be like, why is he talking to the, one of the guests like that? Why is, you know, they shouldn't be talking to the celebrities, blah, 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 you know, like, and, uh, but we knew each other and we were just, you know, having catching up and stuff. But yeah, they, they're so strict sometimes with the, the rules and catering that's again i could talk about you know the, the i say there's too many chiefs on too much opium when it comes to people that run the events and stuff and that's what drives you crazy because the events can be fun you see celebrities you see concerts you see like yeah. i saw living and john warming up and 
getting ready to perform at an event I was working on. She's one of my favorites. So there's a lot of really good fun things in, that I talk about too in the book, but um, but it's those nightmares that, you know, like I joke, people don't want to hear about happy campers. They want to hear about the camper that got attacked by the bear. That's a more interesting <laughs> story. <laughs> Uh, so I don't want to fill the whole hour because I know we can talk about stories of catering and events. Um, let's talk a little bit more about like you. How how are you making it all work for you? Because you're published, you're you're a music a songwriter. Uh, where does this where does the inspiration come from? Where how do you find all that in your head. I don't know how else to explain aspirin. Yeah, uh, well, inspiration comes, uh, you know, I don't really look for it or, or like, I, I I could be driving and I'll get an idea for a song. I could be at the gym on the, you know, the thing and I'll get ideas for the song. Um, if I'm half asleep, that's when I get a laugh. I'm lying in bed and I, like I said, that midnight will be clear. That's how it really came to me. I've had in my sleep, I thought of a title uh, a couple months ago called Never Tame Your Wild Dreams. It, it, literally in a dream, I thought of that title. So when I woke up and I have to right away, write it down or in my phone, say it, because a lot of times I'll be really tired. I'm like, oh, I'll go, I'll remember it when I wake up, I'll go back to sleep. I'll, no, it, it's gone if I do that. So anytime I get an idea, I have to pull out the phone. I was walking on the beach a, a couple of weeks ago and I usually have my phone with me, but I left it in the towel. And as I'm walking, I had a song idea, melody. And I literally for like that 45 minute walk, I had to keep over and over in my head, singing it out loud so I wouldn't forget the melody I was thinking of or the words. And I had the whole chorus done by the time, I, but people must have been looking at me like, <laughs> he's like a homeless person, like talking to himself or something. But yeah, so I don't, and I get ideas for, oh, I got a whole idea for a script at a catering event. Um, they were auctioning off a puppy at a fundraiser. And I just thought, what if they're accidentally auctioning off that dog? Like they're not supposed to be like, it's somebody's dog and somehow, they made a mistake. And the next thing I knew, I wrote a whole thing called The Auction and about, you know, a dog that disappears while a hurricane is coming to, uh, what do you call it, New Orleans, and the family has to leave and they come back and they think the dog perished. And the, but the dog was actually, and so this evil rich woman ends up bidding on a dog she doesn't want. And I, and I get, you know, so that just, I get ideas all, be careful what you say around me too, because it'll become a song or a movie or a book or something, you know. That's pretty cool. I mean, you have to have a pretty busy mind. And before we you answer that, uh, we're halfway through the show, folks. I just want to remind you, you're watching Put It Together Conversations podcast, the five o'clock edition. And my guest today is Sudi Karatash. I, I don't know why I want to say Sari, but Sudi well, Karatash. Well, yeah, but the, you pronounced my last name excellent. That was perfect, actually. And that's, that's the and, harder and one. So. For those of you that wonder, I always ask before the show because I chop up last names like like a butcher. Uh, but, uh, we're talking about uh, writing books and songs and his career uh, out here in California. So stick around, we're gonna talk more about that. But yeah, um, is it, ex and I say that I ask this question, like, is, it, is it exhausting to be Suri Karatash? Well, what's exhausting is like, the actual creative stuff is not exhausting. It's fun. The stuff that comes after that is exhausting. Trying to, if you're, you know, if something is out and promoting it is exhausting. Or getting something made is exhausting. You know, trying to find investors for the film. And I'm trying to find investors for the next film that, you know, it's a family inspirational film with country music in it. So the, the and the BS that comes along with a lot of stuff is exhausting. Um, so, and I think sometimes I forget I'm in my 50s now, I'm not in my 20s. So I'm I'm running around as if I'm in my twenties, and I'm for some reason I'm exhausted the next day. I'm like, why am I so tired? And I realize, oh, because your, yeah. your body is not the same age as your mind, you know. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, before we continue, I, I forget to say this, but if you are watching us live right now and you want to ask a question, make a comment, or be part of the conversation, go into the thread. Remember, it's, it's got to be the black part of the thread. Uh, so I can see your questions and comments, but I see several people, uh, friends of mine who are also actors and uh, directors or producers. So please, if you're watching, if you're still here, please ask questions or join the conversation. But yeah, and I, 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 I'm right there with you because I'll be 50 this in, in a couple of weeks. For those of you that are watching, my birthday is December 26th. Send presents now so that you get here on time. But um, 
I'll be 50. And sometimes I forget because people keep telling me, it's like, oh my God, you look so much younger. And I think I start to believe that, that I look younger, so I should be younger. Um, and, and I try to put everything, I try to do everything. Um, even with everything that you've done, is there something that you're still, like there's still a goal for you? Well, I, I have like nine scripts written and not made. They're, they're sitting here. And since Hollywood only makes remakes and sequels, I guess that's harder to get them made. But um, so my goals are to get not maybe not all of them made, but half of them at least. Um, so that's one of my goals. And then a lot of I have a lot of songs I've written that are just sitting here too, or demos of them. So it'd be great to get those recorded. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of stuff, you know, I haven't even, I feel like I'm just, you know, hitting my stride, <laughs> starting to hit my stride, yeah. um, which, like I said, if I, I think if people that focus, if years ago I said, no, I'm going to really just do this, not just, I've always been pretty good about though, being consistent to a degree of really going after my goals and stuff. But I really wish when I was like in my thirties, even I really just, you know. Yeah. I, and one of the inspirations that I have, uh, cause I came into, I started doing talk shows in 2005 in Houston, but I didn't really get into acting until I was much older. Typical high school stuff, but nothing really. Um, but I remember reading about Dixie Carter who came out in her forties to Hollywood and that's when she landed Designing Women. So she started late in life and she had a pretty good career. So I always used her as my like, okay, if Dixie Carter can do it, I can do it. Like yeah, we, yeah. We're gonna get this. Um, maybe we should do a male version of Designing Women. Let's put that on our to-do list, uh, right. Sudi. That, that'll be, I'm, I'm gonna put that down. Okay. <laughs> Hollywood, are you watching? We need a uh, male version, gay version of Designing Women. And then we're ready to go. Uh, as, as long as we're talking about rehashing old stories, let's do that. Right, no, that's what they do, yeah. Um, in, in the story of, of your life, um, what would be some of the highlights that you would want people to see? To see, well, the, I think it took me like seven years to do that movie, Welcome Mama Friday. So that was the hardest thing I ever did, but the most rewarding. So that was like a big highlight, just to have that come to, you know, your first feature film. And uh, so that was a, a huge highlight. Um, having, actually having my song recorded by someone else, that's another highlight right there. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, I had, you know, when I was younger, there were certain, like, I'm, like I'll start with ninth grade. I, I played Danny Zuko in Greece. That was like really cool. Like that was, I was so shy before that. And then that kind of brought me out of my shell a little bit. Um, and that, I, that's when I said I want to do acting. And then like an idiot, I, in high school, got talked into, you know, no, you got to go to college for business or marketing and all that. So, um, but uh, what are some other highlights? Um, I mean, there's personal things like going to Turkey and seeing my relatives, meeting all my cousins and all that kind of stuff. Um, but God, if you like, you talk about the highlight of like, say this year. Cause, okay. <laughs> but one of them, I did travel once to the East Coast and just, we did a very small like upstate in the mountains re family reunion kind of thing. We were very careful and social distance and all that. And even when I traveled there, just very careful. But that was a highlight just so I, cause getting to see family you haven't seen in a while is is always good. So um, yeah, I don't know if that's what you, you meant just any Yeah, yeah. I mean, cause we all have different points in our life that I, like if I, if I had the movie of my life, I would be my coming out when I was 17, uh, being diagnosed with AIDS, uh, getting clean and sober, and then being diagnosed with cancer are like- oh, are, you, are you, five. is that, um, are you, is it- um, In remission? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in remission oh. now, yeah. Uh, I was diagnosed with anal cancer back in 2015, but it's all behind me now, so we're, we're good, it's all good, so but up bump. Um, that was a pun. I wasn't sure it was yeah. an intentional pun, and I didn't want to make light of something so serious. Okay, but you made the joke. Yeah, I didn't want to be an I didn't want to be an ass and make something light out of. Oh, there you go. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I like. Can being we the say butt that? Of, I, I guess you can. Yes, right please. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like being the butt of the joke, so we're all good. Uh, see, folks. Uh, okay. I'm well, and like you said, you've been reading a little bit of my book, so you know, I I, I make a joke of. Anyone who counts the amount of puns in my books, they win a prize, you know. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. I was I was reading through it, and, and there's a part there where you say, 
they put it on the back burner. Did you catch that or something? And I was like, I like them. I like them. I and then when we first started, for those of you, there's about a 15 minute moment uh, time before the show starts where I get a chance to talk to my guests so we can warm up and get ready for the show. And right before we started, we both came in with this like making. Uh, well, actually, I, I said something about, can you hear me in Spanish? And then you said, yeah, and I said, well, wait, let me Google that. And everybody was like, what? <laughs> so yes, so I knew from the before the show started that that's the direction we're going. And um, uh, But you've been making the rounds lately too here a little bit in Orange County, right? And some of the, because I know you were on um, Rainbow Radio yesterday. With Craig, yeah. With, with yeah. Craig Cooley, uh, love Craig. Craig, uh, I, I, I've co-hosted with him several times and yeah. been a guest on the show, and he is so much fun to be around it. Uh, He's great, yeah. But, uh, I'm, but I'm actually in Van Nuys, California. Yeah, but I, I actually drove down to his. Uh, the last time I was on, uh, it, for the, a couple of years ago to be on his show, but now this time it had to be through Zoom. But um, and I think I'm going to be on Mike Pingle's show coming up and a few other. Again, they're all a lot of them are Zoom. Well, that that one was kind of in person, but again, social distanced. But um, yeah, they're kind of fun. And this is fun. Thank you for having me on this one. It's it's kind of fun just to come and talk and chat and, uh, you know, tell yeah. that joke. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I figure if I'm going to turn 50, I, I need to start getting comfortable with dad jokes. I don't have kids, but I want to be obnoxious and, and just tell bad dad jokes. That's that's my that's my goal in life for the rest of 2020, I think. That's just, just end, end the year right. Um, for those of you watching, we're at, at uh, 45 minutes into the show. Uh, if you are watching this, this Put It Together co uh, Conversations podcast, I'm your host, Daniel G. Garza. And my guest today is uh, author, uh, and I guess uh, author, songwriter, uh, Suri Karatash. Yes. Uh, you, I, you looked at me like I was going to say it wrong. No, I got it right here now. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think how I would say, I guess I say writer, producer, actor, uh, former. Uh, sex symbol. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just <laughs> hey, yes. When you said you played Danny Suko, I was like, "What's up, puppy?" Like, I, I'm a, <laughs> I, 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 the my first album that I owned as a kid was a Broadway uh, soundtrack of Greece, the original on on a track. There you go, folks. Oh wow. There you there you go. If I if I wasn't aging myself, this is it. I, wow. I bought it at the flea market, and I I thought Broadway. Like I I, I didn't know it was gonna be an actor. I didn't know those, but that was my very first. So and anybody who has ever played Danny Suko, you're 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 good in my book. I, I, I dig it. Um, out of if you had to put an order of preference, all your titles, what would be the first one? A writer, then actor, I guess, and then producer, I guess, after that. But, um, but yeah, writer, because I write, yeah, like I said, songs, books, screenplays. Uh, yeah. Um, and, well, as far as, yeah, career wise or whatever. Um, other than that, I'm. Uh, are know. there personal personal titles that that well I'm a, I'm a, I, I kind of say I'm I'm a swimmer I do a lot of swimming I love swimming that's like like the very one of the few sports I ever did I did soccer and swimming um, but um, yeah I don't know I uh, yeah I don't know how else I would um, and I love the beach and I love things like that. So I'm an outdoor. It's weird. I'm a Gemini. So I really do have, you know, that's, I got the two names. I have a part of me that's very mellow and just likes to watch movies or TV. And another part, you know, then sometimes I like to go out and have a, and kind of party and whatever. Not party, you know, drugs or alcohol. But I mean, I, I drink a little, not that much. But um, but I do kind of do feel like sometimes I have two you know, personalities. I think that's I definitely think it. definitely Gemini. As a Gemini, you do. My mom was a Gemini. And she definitely had the two personalities, but I think as as creative souls, we have that two parter. We have the part that is 
that needs the attention that comes with writing, producing, me being, I mean, there's a reason I have four shows on live stream. Um, and then there's the part of me that needs my alone time. Like once I'm done with today, this is my last thing for the day. I will shut down. I will turn the TV on, make a cup of coffee. And, and it's my time. Like it's alone time. Um, why do you, why do you need to write? Um, it's in some ways it's, it's therapeutic, which is good. I don't, that's not really why, but it is, a, it's a result of that. Um, it's, and it's weird. You usually would have to, and it's, that's what I feel like I have to, right. It's not like I have, have a choice. Like, um, I need to get it out. Um, I mean, I don't know why. I, and like I said, since I was little, I, or not little, little, but actually I wrote a song in the womb. It was, let me out of here. No, um, <laughs> but uh, I, it's just, a, you know, I have all these ideas and I enjoy it. Yeah, it's something I love, like time goes like that. If I'm writing, the time goes really fast. When you're doing something you don't like, it drags. Um, so, I, I mean, I would, the goal would be to just write and make a living doing just that, because it's something of doing. So I do make money from it here and there. And, um, but I, if I made it all there, I wouldn't have to do the catering and I wouldn't have to do the, uh, oh, I don't mind doing commercial work and stuff like that. That's fun too. And that, or acting. Um, but that would be the goal just to do those creative things. But yeah, I just, I have to, it's, you, yeah, yeah, I, I, it's almost like air to breathe. You know, it's like, I need to, and don't get me wrong. I don't write every day. I don't like some people. You know, they set up time, okay, 8 a.m. To, to 2 p.m. or 8 and schedule it. I'm not a scheduled person. I don't, you know, when I am have the time, I, okay, sit down and work on this. A lot of times I it just come with the ideas and I'll write it down. And I, I might just stop and, and then a little later in the day, I'll write a little bit more of it. Or the next day when I have an hour, I'll say, okay, let me work on it. Um, if I had to be, what do you call that, scheduled or, um, yeah. Organized. Just, yeah. Uh, no, can't do that. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I really, really, really schedule is appointments like this when I when somebody else is involved. My personal stuff, I can grab, it could be 11 o'clock at night and I'm, I, I think I'm about to go to sleep and I, an idea pops in my head and it's like, grab the laptop, let's get to work. And yeah. before I know it, it's two o'clock in the morning. And it's yeah. so part of the tradition on the show is for my guest to give some words of wisdom out to the people watching and listening. So Suri Karatash, what words of wisdom would you like to share? I, I think that people should do what you really want to do with your life as a career or, or whatever you want to do, do it. I mean, I know that sounds simple, but too many people try to be realistic or they, they want to do something, but they're afraid to do it or they've been talked out of it or they, and some of it's, like I said, is real. You have to balance sometimes. It, um, but I, I really feel like the people that know what they want to do, the people that are really, really successful, they just knew what they wanted. They went for it straight. And look, if you're going for it and things aren't working out or you're not enjoying it anymore, then you, you kind of don't. But if you'd never try it, I think so many people don't really try what they want to do. I feel I get more determined as it, like look, the longer it goes on. Like I have all these scripts. I have all this stuff. I've invested all this time. I hate the question Like people, I'm sure you've been asked or actors get asked all the time, well, how long are you gonna give it? Like, you know, someone who's just getting into acting or they're going to school or they're just got into whatever and people say, how long? Well, if it's something you really want, you don't think in terms of how long I'm gonna go, oh, I'll give it six months and see what happens. And you no, know, you're gonna do it until you accomplish what you wanna accomplish. That if You have to have that mindset. So I think that's my semi words of wisdom. That sounds um, good. Yeah. I mean, because you only you only live once, unless you're Shirley MacLaine. Like, <laughs> you know, I said I said that once in an event. I was passing hors d'oeuvres, and someone said, "Oh, I don't know if I should have it." I'm like, "Oh, come on, you only live once." I go, "Unless you're Shirley MacLaine," and like half an hour later, I see Shirley MacLaine at this event, and I don't know if she was there when I said that. She wasn't anywhere near me, but I just thought that was so funny that I said her name and she happened to be at that event. <laughs> if you're watching this, you're like, "What? Google it." Google it. You need to. Google. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's a whole show on its own. Um, for those of you watching, uh, we're almost coming to the last ten minutes of the show. I am Daniel T. Garza, and this is Put Together Conversations. Remember, here at Little Mission Productions, we have several shows on the air. Make sure that you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, TikTok, 
uh, and I forget where else we are, but uh, make sure you check us out. Uh, we have Wednesdays, we have the Christian and Daniel show at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. On Fridays, it's at six o'clock, it's the Card Devo. And on Saturdays, we have put together conversations podcasts at noon and five with a different guest on every episode. If you miss any of this, if you wanna check them out, uh, you can either check them out here on Facebook Live, just go to the Put It Together podcast page or go to YouTube and there is the whole playlist of all the shows of this series. Remember just this year, we started going live stream so you can check out the videos. There is another playlist on there from previous shows that you can check out. And I will be updating those with some shows that I had from last year that did not air and we'll be posting those out. But remember, these are live. You can join the conversation. Make sure you share with your friends. And if you go on YouTube, will you please subscribe to our page? Just hit the subscribe button. We need more people. Uh, make sure you follow that. And I will be posting on, uh, so if you're watching this on YouTube, go down to the description and you'll find all the links to all of Sudi's work that is on YouTube as well. So you can check those out. Or you can see up here, there's gonna be a little reminder and you can click on that and it'll take you directly to the videos and more information about him. Um, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. You're, yeah, you're so, it's same. So cool. Yeah, thanks. I, I totally did your like, like very casual sense of humor. It's just, just it's it's my style. It's like, like just throw that in there. Um, it, it's total strangers think I'm funny. My family does not think. I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any last words before we go? Um, I don't think so. No, I really appreciate you having me on the show. It was fun. We talked about a lot of good stuff, I think. And uh, hopefully, hopefully I didn't talk too fast. I know I'm from New York and I sometimes will <laughs> talk you know, too fast. You know, when I was younger uh, doing advocacy work in Houston, I went to Philadelphia once and I used to talk a lot faster. I got better once I got into interviewing people and taking my time. And, and But the first time I went to Philadelphia, people were like, are you Puerto Rican? Are you from New York? Like, because I would talk really fast. Blah, 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 blah. Mostly because I was on Coke, but that's another story. Um, but the first time I went to New York, which was just several years ago, um, I so fell in love with, and I say the culture, the, the New York culture. The moment I landed and walked off, I was like, I'm here. I felt, I really felt, and I say this with love and respect because I have a lot of friends from New York. I felt like my inner rudeness just popped out. And it wasn't necessarily being rude. It was just like, I got things to give people. Get out of my way. Let's go. Let's go. Um, do you miss New York? Do you miss the hustle and bustle of it? I, you know, it's funny. What I did love about New York is that energy. And yeah, you're kind of, um, and I've, I've felt, I don't feel I lost that here in LA. I, I feel a lot of people in LA are more laid back and not as driven, some of them. But I don't feel I ever lost that. So I do, I don't, I, it's funny. I loved living in New York. I don't necessarily miss it. Like only because it was, it had become so expensive. And um, I mean, I have friends there I miss and stuff, you know, obviously. So that I miss. Um, but I also like living in LA. So I'm, I'm usually happy where I am. So that's that's a good thing. Um, but there are things I miss. I don't miss the freezing cold. I do miss rain. I miss the seasons. Um, I miss thunder, you know. Uh, well, there's another song I wrote, but I won't get into that now. Um, and um, yeah, but so I, I enjoy going back there and I don't get back as much as I used to, but, um, yeah. and it's changed, you know, it changes too. So it's not like you're going back to the same place. Like we, even where I grew up in Long Island is a lot different, you know. Oh, that's so interesting. The lady that I interviewed on the news, on the noon show is from Long Island. Oh, do you remember where or no? Uh, no, we, we didn't get to that part, but I will, I, I'll send you the link to her. She, not, not like you know her, like, oh, yeah. Of course, everyone on Long Island knows each other. Yeah, yeah, Danielle Turco from Long Island. Don't you know her? Um, I, I, I have two more questions before we go. We have five minutes. I have you for five more minutes. Um, number one, because I, 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 I think that you've succeeded in so many things, but what does the word success mean to you? That's a really good question. Because a lot of people think in uh, entertainment, success is only if you're a household name. I, I'm, in, I'm a household name. Everyone in my household knows my <laughs> name. No, but they think you, unless you're famous or you're, you're making millions of dollars as an actor or a singer or whatever, that that's success. And I don't think it, I think if you can do what you love doing and, and you know, make a decent living at it, let's say, um, that's success. Or if you've, you know, there's so many things I still want, I want to do that I haven't done or wasn't able to do. 
but there's little successes. Like even the, the movie, was it a huge blockbuster movie? No, but it was on Netflix. It was this, it was that. Um, and did, was the books on the bestseller? No, but I finished it. I got published, you know? So there's, I think that success is if you're doing what you really want to do, if you're helping people, you're, you're being successful, like in whatever you're doing. So if there's a nurse, if she's a nurse and she's helping people, unless she's, you know, nurse Jackie, whatever, <laughs> then that's a good thing. You know, I think that's successful. So I think people's idea of success is not, you know, how much money you're making. I don't, th I mean, you, that shouldn't be the only level of success that we measure, you know. Um, good, good. Yeah, I think. I did a movie in 2013 that went on to DVD and, and Amazon. And I have a movie in Amazon, folks, in case you didn't know. Um, What's the name of it? Uh, I think that they have it under Street King. OK. Uh, OK, I'll send you the link so you can check it out. Uh, but when, when we went to the premiere in San Diego and I saw my name on a big screen on a credit, I was like, that's it. Like, I mean, I want to do more, but if this, if God, if on the way out of the movie theater, God was like, dude, we got to go. I'd be like, I, I did a movie, man. Like, I'm good. Like, let's get out of here. And having this show, having a podcast for eight years, um, even after cancer and surviving all that, I, I feel like I'm succeeding. And to have guests like you come on the show and share your stories. Uh, and some of you don't even know me. And you're, I just, for those of you, yes, some of these folks, you know the stories. I always tell the stories. How we met. Some of these folks don't know me. I just, I stalk them on social media till they say yes. And uh, I'll stand outside the door and let me in. Um, and uh, so for me, that's successful to have some people like you come on the show that um, have careers that I look at now and go, wow, I, I want to I wanna follow in your footsteps. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and since you're a writer and we're down to the last two minutes, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you, what, what name should we give this episode? Oh, um, oh God, now, yeah, you're opening it on the spot. Um, oh, uh, the best guest I ever had on the show. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. When you guys see this coming up, because it'll be, uh, this will be up in uh, in a week. So you guys wait, wait to see what I put on there. Uh, for now, uh, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, as the song says. <laughs> Sudi, are we twins? We must be twins, because that's what I tell I tell my partner that all the time. Oh, I'm do you like, know that song by Mac Davis, who passed away this year? He had a song. It's hard to be humble, and it's a very funny song. But I'm gonna have to listen to it. But yeah. I tell him every day, I'm like, I only wake up because the people need to see me. That's. <laughs> What would, what would the world be without a little Mexican? Uh, for, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it has part. been. Thanks. I appreciate it. For everyone watching, thank you again. I want to thank my director, Mr. Christian Paul Ramirez, my producers, um, Kevin Moyers from Enormal Entertainment, Jose Reyes from Hubris Management, and my agent, Jennifer Sims from RPM Talent. Uh, please follow us all on social media. Uh, make sure you, if you're watching this on YouTube, you subscribe, share this with your friends, like us on all the pages, uh, follow us along. There will be more guests next week. Uh, what's next week? The 12th. No, uh, yes, we'll have two more guests next week, so stay tuned for that. Make sure that you follow me on Put It Together Conversations Podcast on Facebook for information on my guest and uh, where you can find them. And remember, if you're on YouTube, go down to the description and you'll see all the links so you can find Sudi. Uh, Karatash, wherever he is, um, and make sure you go and follow him, subscribe to his page, and like his videos. Uh, for now, I want to thank uh, Sudi Rick Karatash for being on the show. I want to thank you for watching, and this is Daniel G. Garza saying, hey, put it together.